I, I wonder if you might be able to comment. So your dad does happen to be somebody who boldly seeks this kind of um, deep understanding of physics the underlying nature of reality from a physics perspective, from a mathematical physics perspective. Uh, do you have hope your dad figures it out? I have great hope. You know, it's not it's not supposed to be my journey. It's supposed to be his journey. It's supposed to be his to uh, express to the world. Obviously, I'm I'm so proud that I'm connected to someone who is determined to do such a thing. And on the other hand, uh, you know, maybe in some sense, I, I feel bad for him for having to, if he's going to be the the thing which which discovers some sort of grand unified theory and expresses it, I feel sorry that he will have to, to smudge um, whatever <laughs> canvas this thing is because- <laughs> Because he's human. <laughs> really, I think- I know uh, I've seen a little bit of what I think great math and great physics looks like, and it's it's unbelievably beautiful. And then you have to present it to a world with you know like market constraints and all of this like messy sloppiness. I feel bad um, in some sense for my dad uh, because he has to go back and forth between this beautiful world of math and whatever the the messiness is of his, you know, his human life. And then the scientific community broadly with egos and tensions and just exactly. the, the dynamics of our, of what makes us uh, human. He's yeah. also very lucky that he gets to play with these sorts of things. It's, it's a mixed, it's a mixed bag. Uh, I both feel a little sorry for him for having to deal with the beauty as well as the, uh, the smudging and the, the sloppiness of, human expression and i think it's difficult not to envy such a um such a beautiful insight or life or, or or vision so well that's your own path as well is this kind of struggle of um as you mentioned exploring the beauty of different ideas mm -hmm. while having to communicate those ideas w with the best smudges you can uh, in a world that wants to put labels, that wants to misinterpret, that wants to uh, that wants to destroy the beauty of those ideas, and that's you seem to at this time with your youthful enthusiasm, uh, embracing that struggle uh, despite the fear in the face of fear. So, and uh, your dad also carries that same youthful enthusiasm as well. But that said, you know your dad Eric Weinstein. He's a powerful voice, I would say, a powerful mm -hmm. intellect in public discourse. Is this a burden for you or an inspiration or both as a young mind yourself? I think, as I said, there's this, this, there's this weird contrast of, um, you know, I know that he has ideas which I think are, are very beautiful and I know he has to deal with um, the sort of, uh, there's there's something you you have to sacrifice in beauty uh, when when you bring it to a world which is not always um, beautiful, um, and there's there's an aspect of that which sort of scares me about uh, this kind of thing. I also think that um, especially since I'm trying to think about how I should appear publicly, my dad has been very inspirational in that I think he's he brings a sort of fastidious care to very difficult conversations that what does fastidious mean? Um like it's just very careful okay. and um thoughtful. Um he brings that sort of attitude to um I think really difficult conversations and I know that I don't have that skill yet. I don't think I'm terrible. But so the care, the nuance, and yet not being afraid to push forward. Yeah, I would really like to to learn from my dad there. I think also my dad has been very important uh, to my life just because I've always been a, a sort of very idiosyncratic thinker. Um, and I think I don't always know how to interact with the world for those sorts of reasons. And 
I think my dad has always been similar. And if not for my dad, I don't know if I would just believe that like I, I was stupid or something. Mm. Um, because I wouldn't know how to, how to, I don't know if I would know how to interpret uh, my differences from convention. So, so he gave you, he gave you the power to be different and use that as a superpower. Yeah. I, I guess you could, you could put it that way. I don't know who I would believe I am if uh, I didn't have my dad telling me that it wasn't my own stupidity, which alienated me from certain aspects of uh, standard life. So I'm very, very thankful for that. Is there a fond memory you have about an interaction with your dad, either funny, profound, that kind of sticks with you now? <laughs> A lot. <laughs> <laughs> part part of the reason I asked that, of course, is just fascinating to uh, see somebody as brilliant as you, see how your the people that you interact with, how they form the mind that you have, but also to give an insight of another public uh, figure like your dad to see from your perspective of um, what kind of little magical moments happen in private life. I would say, I remember. I think I just posted about this on, on Instagram or something. I re <laughs> Otherwise it didn't happen if, if you didn't post that, yeah. One person who's always sort of mattered to whatever weird life and experience I've had has been this this comedian, Tom Lehrer. Mm -hmm. um, do, you, do you know him? Yes, He's, yeah. uh, I love him very much. Likewise. Um, anyway, I remember, I think I was five or something. My dad came home with the, with the CD this Tom Lehrer CD and he told me to to listen to it. And it was all of this like bizarre uh, satirical writing about, you know, like prostitution and you know, cutting up babies and like all kinds of like ridiculously vile um, content for a, for a five-year-old. I think beyond just my love of, of Tom Lehrer, I think it was, a way for my dad to express that from a very young age, he was, uh, he was really ready to treat me like an adult and he was ready to, to trust me and share, um, share his, his life and his, uh, enjoyments with me, um, in a way that was unconventional because he was willing to, uh, discard tradition for the chance at a really uh, unique and meaningful uh, parental relationship. So trusting that the, his particular brand of weirdness is something you can understand at a young age and embrace and learn from it. Tom Lehrer, we should clarify, is not all about, what is it, murder and prostitution. He's one of the wittiest, most brilliant musical right. artists. If, if you haven't listened uh, to his work, you should. He's just uh, a rare, intellect who's able to sort of in catchy rhyme express some really difficult ideas and sat through satire i suppose um that, will, that still even though it's decades ago still resonates today some of the ideas that he expressed i will say also that um i think i am probably uh a a more cultured person having listened to tom lehrer than i would have been without i think a lot of his comedy uh draws upon a canon that I was really driven to to research by saying, "Oh, well, what does this mean? I don't I don't understand that reference." There are a lot of references there to um, really, really inspirational things, which he sort of assumes going into a lot of his songs. And for many of us, like like me, you have to piece those things together. You know, looking at, at Wikipedia pages and whatnot. But um, to tie this back to the original question, I think. Um, I think there's sort of a, a break it, you bought it notion of parenting. I think uh, really, if you're, if you're not going to accept a, a standard, um, you have to invent your own. And I think in some ways that was my dad's way of telling me that if I was too unstandard as a child, he wouldn't, he would invent his own way of parenting me because that was worth it to him. And I think that was very meaningful to me. I know you're young. This is a weird time to ask this question. Uh, 
are you cognizant on the role of love in your relationship with your dad? Are you at a place uh, mentally as a man yourself uh, to admit that you love the guy? I love my dad like I, uh, with the connection that I think I've had to very few things in the world. I think my dad is one of the people that's allowed me to see myself and I don't know uh, who I would imagine myself to be if not for my dad. That isn't to say that I agree with him on everything, but I think he's given me courage to accept myself and to believe that I can uh, teach myself where I'm unable to to learn from convention. So I have a very, <laughs> I love my dad very dearly, yes. Is there ways in which you wish you could be a better son? Firstly, I'd like to say I'm sure before I, I figure out exactly what those are. I think if I, I think whenever I come to conclusions on what that means, I'm, I'm eager to uh, to take them. Um, what do you mean by that? Uh, what, what, what do you mean by conclusions? If I have an idea for how to be a better son, I think I'm I'm inclined to to try to be that person. I think that's true of almost anything. I think if I have uh, ideas for improvement, it would be wasteful not to not to not to act on them. So, um, I suppose one thing I could say is that um, I think idealism and what could almost be considered naivete is not necessarily a um, a lacking of maturity, but instead an obligation to those older than us who have lived lived and seen too much um, to fully believe uh, in what is naive and right without um, without the assistance of the young to re-inspire uh, traditional idealism. And so perhaps instead of trying to be uh, more mature uh, all the time, I should spend some time trying to be uh, an idealistic form of hope in the lives of people who maybe have seen too much to retain all of that original hope. So uh, that's something that's that's difficult, but you know, especially appearing in public as someone as as young as I am, uh, I think anything I do, which is juvenile by choice, will be held against me. So, but maybe that's a sacrifice that I I have to make. I have to retain some sort of youthful hope and optimism. Yeah, I can't. I mean, uh, I'm gonna get teary eyed. No, but I have allergies. <laughs> but I also, this is pretty powerful what you're saying. I certainly share your ideas. It's something I struggle with. I've just by instinct, you should read The Idiot by Dostoevsky. By instinct, I'm, I love being naive and uh, seeing the world from a hopeful perspective, from an optimistic perspective. And it is, it's sad that that is something you pay a price for in this world. Like in the academic world, especially as you're coming up uh, through through schooling, but just actually, it's a hit on your reputation throughout your life, and it's a sad truth. But you have to like for many things. If it's a principle you hold, you have to be willing to pay the costs. And ultimately, I believe that in part, a hopeful view will help you realize the best version of yourself. Because optimism is a kind of, um, optimism is productive. <laughs> like uh, believing that the world is and can be amazing is um, allows you to create a more amazing world somehow. I mean, I'm not sure if, uh, I'm not sure if it's a human nature or a fundamental law of physics, I don't know. But uh -huh. uh, believing the impossible in the sense, being optimistic about the thing it's 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 similar like going back to what you've said is like believing that a radical that a powerful single idea that a single individual can uh revolutionize some framework that we're operating in that will 
change the world for the better. Believing that allows you to have the chance to create that. And so I'm, I'm with you on the optimism, but it's a, you may have to pay a cost of optimism and uh, naive hopefulness. And I mean, in some sense, optimism limits freedom. Uh, I think if we don't really have much choice in choosing what is perfect, if it exists as, as an ideal, um, then there isn't much room for for creativity, and that's a danger of optimism. As someone who uh, would like to be creative, I think I think it was Warren Zevon said, uh, "Accepting dreams, you're never really free," and that's something I, I think about a lot. Um, he's an interesting guy, also. I really like him. 